Richard Doherty, and we farm on a property called Bilala Station, 10 kilometres west of Urala, in the New England area of New South Wales. Our property is, has an average rainfall of about 790 mils. Currently, rolling average at the moment is about 410, and so we've had about 18% of our annual rainfall so far in August. We're about at 160 mils this year, so it's been incredibly trying in this area, in drought period that is really testing every limit and everything in the whole system. Our country is mainly a breeding area, and so we have a self-replacing flock of merinos producing superfine wool, and also we do have breed cattle, Angus cattle, following all the best practice type farming principles like trying to carve them as a two-year-old, minimum joining times and likewise with the sheep as well and we focused heavily on genetics to help us get there and something of big interest now is sort of epigenetics of how these animals actually fare and cope within the environment in which they are born. And I think that plays a big part in their ability to be able to, one, produce, but also to be healthy in how they live and operate, well, how they live in situation. You know, they just adapt to the feed and the climate better by having been born and bred here. And so that sort of carries through with them. We moved from South Africa to Balala in 2011. We've been here, what, eight years now? There was a period in the beginning where we leased out the property for three years. And so we've really been on the farm and took it over at the end of 2014. In that period, it's been an incredibly steep learning curve. Um, we've come from Africa. I haven't been in farming before for the last close on 20 years. I've been living in the bush and been involved in hospitality in a wildlife situation, showing and taking people on experiences in big game areas, being able to share with those guests the whole balance that nature plays in how we all exist in a set of ecosystems that all have their particular place and everything's got a place in there. It's been really interesting bringing that across and trying to incorporate that into a farming practice that I'm trying to farm with nature. Sheep and cattle have a huge place in the fact that they also live with things from insects to echidnas to platypus to birds and you know your varying other mammals and they are just one part in that whole system. They've got to be productive from a financial perspective to keep the whole operation going. We are in one of the worst droughts in history that we know of, we really have to address water hydrology, the water hydrology cycle, the nutrient cycle, the mineral cycle, your, the plant cycle in, in photosynthesizing energy from a free source like the sun and actually creating from that the whole food chain that, that occurs from that. Soil isn't just dirt, you know, soil is a living thing. Everything stems from that. And one of the drivers of that is having green leaf area drive photosynthesis to be able to feed the microbes in the soil, which then go up the food chain. We've always just looked at it from the surface up as what the ecosystems are in those varying trophic levels. But there's a huge inverted pyramid underneath the soil. And I think once we start addressing and, and having an appreciation for the fact that it's a living thing, then I think we can move forward and do something. In these dry years, trying to get the water right, trying to get the organic matter back into the soil, using animals as tools. We live in a very brittle environment. We have very low humidity. Using those animals to actually take it back down and put it back on in contact with the soil so that living organisms in the soil can actually start feeding on those on that humus layer, whether it be dung or leaf litter. We really have to look at trying to get the biological life happening into a living soil again. In our area we're very deficient in phosphorus that so we really have to look at and identify where these weak links are in our whole system. When I came here I was trying to understand why certain practices were done like carving in the middle of winter and I think that was all market driven. 
I was to try and bring the farming system back into a natural system. In the southern hemisphere, there's a, a particular antelope ungulate species in southern Africa called the earlunt, and which is very close as a bovine to cattle. And their natural cycle is that they carve in November to meet the energy needs of animals in their breeding cycle when they have the highest demand is to try and bring it back into what the natural world was. Find out with sheep when their natural breeding cycle would have been. Bring that back to other browsing, grazing animals like some of the gazelle or impala, which is an antelope species, and to see when their natural cycle was. In the past, in, in our cold winters, you would have found that a lot of species would have migrated and moved away from this area and then come back into the area in summer. We have a definite feed gap in winter. We have really cold winters, everything browns off. A lot of the biology um, also goes dormant in that period and they go deeper, leaving ground cover, having a humus layer, creating these, this space where it's almost like a blanket over the soil and keeping the soil one or two degrees warmer than what it would have been if it was just bare earth or heavily grazed. I think would also give some of the microbes half a chance in the soil. I'm looking at putting in some cover crops and interspersing that in native pasture and improving the native pasture with having green matter during the winter. There are some natural native species of your C3 grasses that also grow during the winter period. I don't know whether they produce enough liquid carbon through photosynthesis to be able to sustain the microbe activity. Um, looking at a cedar that has row spacings that are 40 centimeters, trying to put some of those winter mixed cover crop species into the system.